tired of it. Yeah. But um, that's harsh stuff. That's yeah. that's really harsh. You know, yeah. we talked about that too. And, uh, we are on live. Good afternoon, everybody. Howard Thompson here, aka Help Me Howard. We are here in the social media center. Still getting my brain wrapped around that. SMC. I'm sitting here with a good friend, and I guess you can call him a professional colleague, private investigator from Staten Island, John Curley. Thank you, Howard. It's right. a pleasure to be here. Good to see you. Good to see Same you. Same here. I understand you have a new book out. Congratulations Thank on you. that. And uh, one of your latest literary efforts. You have a lot of short stories that have been published as well. Yes. But before we even get into the book, I want to you know, thank you for coming again. But I want to My talk, pleasure. Uh, let's talk about how you and I first got involved, how we first met and just working. And um, I believe it's a, a gentleman named Robert Schneff. Robert Schneff, Some of you yeah. Who, who've been uh, following my exploits for the past 10, 15 years, know all about Mr. Schnepp. But, yeah, yeah, Bobby. Yeah. The bald ghost. Yeah, and he's, he's still out there. He's still out there, he's still yes. still out there. Yeah, Robert Schnepp is, is a guy, uh, for those of you who are not familiar, who has spent uh, spends most of his, his working day uh, basically conning young women out of their money. Or homeowners. Of, or their homes. Or, or, or banks. Back. And he has been uh, working the East Coast for, what, about 10, 10, yeah. about 10, 15 years? And he's been caught by the police once or twice, but he keeps getting sprung. Yep. But that's how John and I started working together. The first time I did a snap story, and uh, John saw one of my stories, and we... It was uh, someone that you were you were representing at that time. Was yes. one of the clients, yeah. and uh, that's how you first started uh, yes. working on things and uh, getting to know one another. You're very so, fortunate for me. Yeah, for and for me too. It's uh, we've had some interesting adventures. Yes. So listen, how, tell our viewers how you first started. You've been in the business for over thirty years. I mean, how does one I know, just become I, a I private investigator? I look way investigator? too young for that. Is that what you're trying yeah. to say? That I don't look like I've been in my clumsy way, John. Yes. yes. Um, <laughs> How'd you start this thing, though? Well, when I was uh, something, I kind of fell into it. I was uh, I was considered to be a child prodigy. I was bound for uh, college. My father was killed when we were young, and um, after that, my grades kind of plummeted. I didn't really pay attention in high school, and you know, I, I think I squeaked by with whatever and never did homework or anything like that. Just kind of lost interest. And after high school, I went to work with my mother at you know, my brothers and I, it was kind of an emotional thing. We wanted her to keep my father's business going. My father was actually, it wasn't, we don't know for sure that he was killed. Um, he, he disappeared. There was a... Was your father an investigator? No. Uh, my father disappeared because he preferred the company of wise guys. Okay. If you recall the movie Goodfellas, yes. there, were, there was a heist at Lufthansa. Mm -hmm. The heist... Very famous heist. Yes. yes. The silver that was stolen made its way through my father's warehouse. The FBI said one of three different things. He knew about it and they killed him. He didn't know about it and they killed him or he ran. Never found a body. That kind of uh, just as we wanted my mother to keep my father's business going and she did. Eventually she sold it and now I'm a, a young adult and I don't have you know, I'm working kind of hard to go back to school after that, you know, earning a living, and I stumble into uh, private investigations. I did a little boxing at the time, and one of my sparring partners was a PI, and his boss was looking for someone, yeah. you know. I spent my first day... Is that your first case? No. no. Uh, you know what? I, I'm at peace with that. I loved my father, mm -hmm. but he what happened to him happened because of his actions, right. and I... You know, so that wasn't, a, oddly enough, a lot of people ask me that, that wasn't a driving force. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> my first day on Friday the 13th, March, 1987, I spent getting lost in Long Island. Some guy takes a swing at me because I serve him with a subpoena, and I have a car accident on the way home. I walk in, I throw the stuff on the mm -hmm. boss's desk. I said, keep this job. Yeah, and I not walk for out. me. No. He calls me a couple of days later. He said, you know, you're, you're a smart guy. I could really use somebody. I, do you have a job, by the way? And I was like, no. He said, well, work with us a little bit. And I said, okay. And um, I've been doing it ever since. What were those first jobs like, though? I mean, you're, how old are you at that point? What, I was uh, 20. You're I wasn't, 20 years I wasn't old. even 21 you're yet. You're not even 21 no. years old, you're, and you're already a private detective, and you're, you're doing legwork. <sighs> yeah, a lot of, with, with a we lot did of a lot of service people. of process. Yeah. A lot of some some protection work. My first surveillance, I I'm begging them, let me do a tail job, you know. Yeah. And finally, Father's Day that year, he you know Friday, 
before Father's Day. We're at the court of claim at the Trade Center. You know, and the guy that's breaking me in, he's an older guy. I mean, I'm trying to be cool. We're in the, the elevator at the Trade Center. He hands me a pouch. It's chewing tobacco. So I don't want to look like an idiot, which I managed to I, do. I managed to do anyway, because when I took the, the chew and I put it in my mouth, the elevator jumped and I swallowed it. Awful so feeling. I've uh, been there. for three days. Yeah. So my first surveillance is in a 77 Dodge Aspen outside this guy's house with a window that won't roll down with the sun beating in and two bottles of Pepto-Bismol on the, uh, the console. And that was it. That was the first day. You want to hear the second day? Sure. Why not? The man had um, Alzheimer's, okay? we got to remember, we didn't have cell phones back then. We had beepers. I don't even think I, I remember had beepers. I remember beepers, John. I, I don't even think I'm I, of a certain My age boss too. was a great guy, but he was cheap. We didn't even have beepers. Guy gets up Sunday morning, 7 o'clock, walks down Little Clove Road, gets on a bus, takes the bus Bay Street, goes down Bay Street, ends up in a park. It's early. It's ba not even 7 o'clock, right? I see these two guys casing him. And I don't know what to do. You know, I'm following the guy, and I, it, it starts to, and I'm, I'm listening to them, and they're talking about robbing this guy, my, the guy I'm following. I'm following him for his daughter, who left him alone on Father's Day, but wanted to make sure he was okay. And I'm listening to these two guys, and they're going to boost him, and they're going to take his wallet. And I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm panicking because I'm. Yeah, what do what I you, do? What are you going to do? Right? It occurs to me that I'm sure the client would not want me to let her father get mugged so there were two of them and they're getting ready to jump on him and i walked up from behind them and i i took one of them out of commission and i told the other guy i'm going to do that to you if you don't leave and he did so i found a pay phone called my boss he said to me you are in for one hell of a career he said in all the years i've done this never anything like that and he was right john was that much. the hook was that was that assignment the hook that I put it in your that, you know, yeah, this that, is what i'm gonna yes, do i can do yes. this Yes. It's because it's it's it, there's a rush of adrenaline with this. There was a rush of you know, adrenaline. Right? You have to use your brain as a, as a private investigator. You don't have the same um, you don't have the same abilities that a cop does. Despite no, what don't. people say, you see the badge. They tell you talk to me. Most people will talk to them. All right, they'll tell you. Most people are yeah. idiots. They'll tell you something right. else. I though. have to figure out a way to get people to talk to me. And right get it out of them in such a way that they don't realize that they're talking to them. There's more finesse involved. You don't sometimes, have the uniform. Yes. Yeah. You can't always have And to, you don't have that kind of power. Yeah, and you, sometimes you have to be the the steel fist underneath the velvet glove. Yes. As well. Yes. That's uh, that's a key thing. So you do a lot of mat criminal matrimonial work right now. Can you tell our viewers basically what that entails and Well, um as far it, as it's more, I would imagine it's more than just spying on spouses that are involved in it. Yes, we do some of that also. Mm -hmm. um, I, these days, I don't. I, I run an agency. I don't often leave. I don't often do field work anymore. Um, when it comes to criminal work, uh, that that can be anything. I mean, we've handled all kinds of cases from minor things to homicides, RICO cases, things like mm -hmm. that. Um, matrimonials are not really so much follow the husband, follow the wife. It happens, right. but more or less nowadays it's mostly custody. Custody. Yes. Yeah. Non custodial abductions and things like that. Sometimes, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes runaways. Uh, a lot of times, uh, parental fitness yeah. as far as that goes, mm -hmm. and the legal system. Notice I said legal system and not justice system does not lend itself often to the proper resolution. Right. And sadly, Did you get political on this, John. No. Okay. Uh, no. Um, well, when it comes to politics, yeah. both parties suck. Yeah. When it comes to the legal system. How do you really feel? Well, that's and bo <laughs> both parties suck when it comes to child care. All right. Well, listen. Let's let's move on from that. We have yes. some, we have some questions from some of the viewers who are watching right now on Facebook. Uh, Joe Gutfield wants to know what has been your toughest case. Uh, Joe, I, I could. I, I mean, I there was in in general, people often ask me what is the hardest or the most intricate type of case I work on. Um, and the, the answer everybody expects is homicide cases. Now, that is serious business because you are basically in a part of what's going to happen to this guy for the rest of his life, guilty or innocent. Right. But that is not the most intricate type of case or the most serious type of case that we do. You see, you and me... Um, we end up in the legal system, we have a car accident, God forbid we get divorced, you get arrested, okay? 
we're adults, we're intelligent, we can deal with it. The outcome's probably not going to be what we like, but we can deal with that, okay? The worst kind of case I deal with are custody cases where there's abuse. Because if the judge makes the wrong decision, the children are sent home as a trophy to the abuser. Yes. That is the worst, toughest, hardest kind of case that we work on. That is hideous. It is absolutely hideous. hideous. And it happens a lot, too often. More often than the viewers yes. realize. Far more often. Yeah. When you go into the, uh, the system for a, a family court case, a matrimonial case, a, a hearing because of abuse or neglect, um, it's a roll of the dice. Okay, there are four specific dice rolls. Okay, first roll of the dice, who's your lawyer going to be? The guy that your neighbor says represented him in a divorce, there was no custody issues, it was black and white and anybody could have done it, now he thinks he's the greatest thing since sliced bread. But you need somebody that specializes in custody because your partner's a problem, it drinks too much. Right. All right, so now you got the wrong lawyer, okay? The second roll of the dice, who does your spouse get as a lawyer, okay? That can, there are, there are people that might inflame the situation just to make, get more money out of it. Your third roll of the dice is the judge, okay? Sometimes you end up with somebody that used to be a real estate lawyer making a decision as to who gets custody of those kids. Not all. They're, and I want to make this right. clear. Yeah, there are great not all, not all no, judges not all. Not all. Are, are former real estate no, lawyers who absolutely are not now sitting but, on the bench. Not absolutely not, but you'll ha you have that. So right. are you going to get the right judge? Are you? You don't know. You don't. What's the fourth roll? The fourth roll of the dice is the forensics. Okay? Who, who's going to do the forensics? Who's going to be the psychologist that, that is assigned to interview the kids? Are they competent? There's no... It's usually someone for protective services, though, isn't it? No. Uh, when, it, when you... Uh, ACS yes. is different. That's when there's a complaint made, they, they go into action. ACS is a whole other problem. Right. Um, the, the people that do the forensics, a psychologist that inter interviews the child, uh, how do you know he's any good? Okay, there's no accountability here. Law guardians are appointed in cases where there's abuse or neglect, so, okay? It, but there's no review process. There's so no way it, to check to see if they're doing a good job. There's no training involved. It's incredibly difficult. They, Very. May, they may need you in Albany on this. They really might. Yeah. Now, one more, one well, more <laughs> another question here, Joe. Uh, Skip, uh, Arius, Smith, Arius Smith Jr., that is, what do you know about Skip and Locate? Uh... Well, it was a game we used to play. You'd skip, and then you'd try to locate the little piece of chalk. I don't know. Yeah, no, exactly. skip, <laughs> skip tracing and locating, it's, it's a generic term. It means uh, skip trace is you're looking for somebody that you can't find. Somebody can't find somebody, and you look. Do you get a lot of those? Sure. Yep. These days, it's a lot simpler because the databases are very sophisticated. Right. the technology. Okay. Right. However, that does not replace a field investigator. You know, that only goes so far. Yeah, once again... Good old-fashioned gumshoe work, going out and knocking on doors right. and looking for people. Yes, which is how we met. Right. Pretty much, yeah. That's it. Um, let's see here. A couple more questions, then we're going to keep moving on. <laughs> you know Anne Marie Vigipiano? Uh, Anne Marie Vigipiano? Vigipiano? I think so. Okay. One of us needs some coffee. Okay. <laughs> okay. All, right. All right, we're gonna put we're gonna put the questions down for the viewers right now. You can never have right. enough coffee. Okay. So look, um, tell me, you know, we watch you're, you're a private investigator in the in books, in literature, and in movies. It seems that private investigators always have this sort of fractious relationship with law enforcement. Have you found that in your case, where they in your career, where they they'll work with you, but at the same time, it's like ah, oh, you know, Curly's coming around. You know, uh, uh, you know, honestly, it depends. Most um, most people that are in law enforcement understand that we have a job to do. L listen, uh, you know that I advocate for child protection, for example, okay? But I go by conviction. I believe in due process. Right. We cannot uh, devolve into a society right. where you're guilty, do, I say so, so you're guilty. There do, has to be due process. You, my, I guess my question is, do you have a good working relationship with the police? It depends. It depends. Most of the time, believe it or not, yes. Yeah. So, most, so you're a help, John, and not a hindrance in no, most cases. No, they just realize we have a job to do. Younger guys generally don't like us right. because they're they're used to putting the bad guys away. Right. And you know, i you know, here's the story. We're we're going to look at it on a percentage basis. 
you got 100% of the people that are arrested in the system, okay? Uh, you've been doing this stuff for a long time, so see how close you agree with me. I'd say about 75 to 80% 80, 80 of the people that are arrested should be arrested, okay? I'd say maybe 10% depends how you feel about it. You know, should you get arrested for weed? I don't think so. It you depends know, on the circumstances. Right. Maybe ten percent, five to ten percent shouldn't not be in that system. Any statements on, on right. marijuana? No, we're no, we're society. we're talking in generalities okay. here. Like I said, that portion is mm -hmm. what you feel personally right. constitutes a crime. Maybe five to ten percent don't belong in that system. Okay. The problem is once you're in that system, okay, it wants you. It wants a piece out of you. Prosecutors run for office on their record of Basically. conviction, and a plea bargain is a conviction. Uh, and all yes, the people I out know. there, and this is a pet yeah, peeve of mine. Unfortunately, we're about to, we're probably going to find this out soon. All the people yeah. out there that say, "Well, I, if if I was innocent, I would fight it." Really? Yep. You know what? When the feds land on you for something you swear you didn't do, and they hit you for twenty charges for the same thing, and 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 any one of them puts you away for twenty years, and they offer you four years. You don't think you're going to take it yeah, when you're, you're looking at a million dollars right, for your defense? That's right. You're going to take the four okay, years. Okay, so the, you know, plea, there are a lot of people that conviction. feel that way that end up sitting across from me and crying about right. it. And that's and there's nothing that can be I done. W I wish we had a whole half hour or an hour to sit here and talk because I, I, you and I both know we could do it. But let's get to your book, your new book. This is the galley copy. It's the galley it comes copy, comes out yes. next week. It's yes. called Bonds. It's called Bonds, Your yes. first big literary effort. Yes. Tell me about it. Tell us about um, it. It's... What I'm hoping to do is to give people a good read and entertain them and at the same time bring certain things to their attention. Um, central character, characters? Central character, yes. Uh, the, 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 the title refers to the relationship between the characters and the bonds that they make. Is this loosely based on your experiences? I have no knowledge of that question, <laughs> Senator. Um, I will say this. I was fortunate enough, um, I, I had... A peer review of sorts, okay? Um, retired Deputy Police Chief Michael Marino reviewed my work to see if he thought the interaction with the police department, like you asked before, yes. and the police procedures were accurate, and he gave me the thumbs up. Excellent. I've had a plethora of violence experts, a whole bunch of people that we can't talk about on television, <laughs> review it, and uh, say, this is realistic. I've had attorneys take a look at it for me and say, this is, everything is so. What happens in the book either has in some form, can, or will happen at some point in time. And if I can educate people as to, like, one of the things that's discussed in the book is the rolls of the dice that we mm -hmm. talked about. You know, if I can educate people and give them a good read at the same time, then I've accomplished what I set out to do. Well, I've read the first few pages of it, and you really put the hook in. It, it really starts out like a great, gritty, tough New York Thank crime you. story. And if you can do that, I think everyone's in for a real treat and a really great education. I appreciate that. Thank you. John Curley, New York City, Staten Island, private investigator. A.K.A. Boy Genius. Boy Genius, that That's is a right. private joke out there, folks. Thank you very much, my friend. Thank Good you. Good to see you. And uh, next, Peter Lugers is on me, I believe. I think I owe you this one this time. Yeah, I think, yeah. You got a deal. Yeah, my turn. That's fair enough. And that we're not going to get much done that day. Not like, at all. Like, no. No, that just doesn't happen. Folks, that is it for this Wednesday afternoon. Help me, Howard, 3 p.m. Uh, we will be here next week. I'm not sure who's going to be here. I may be here by myself or have another sterling guest like Mr. Curley. But until then... I could wear a wig. <laughs> yeah, I, I, we don't want to see that. Trust me, you do not want to I don't to see want to know. You don't. Okay. <laughs> All right, folks. Tune in today for the Pix 11 News at 5, 6, and 10 o'clock. 5 o'clock with Tamsin and Corey. 6 o'clock, Tamsin and John. With Tamsin and John again at 11 o'clock. And, of course, our sterling morning show with the entire gang. See you next week. Have a great day. Stay safe.